Uh, I'm Alex Wen from the Department of Political Science. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Elizabeth Beth uh, Shackman Hurd over here to the Mershon Center um, as the second of our speakers in a series that Jennifer Mitson and I put together on called Critical Research and in International Theory, or CRIT. Um, when you think about the universe of people who do critical IR scholarship, um, Beth's name might not pop up right away, um, but I think that's probably because she works in the area of religion and politics, um, which has never been a bastion of critical work, as far as I know, um, at all, certainly within IR. Um, but however, as you'll see from her talk today, and as I learned last night at dinner about the company she keeps, um, her work is definitely in the critical vein, uh, broadly defined at least, um, and I think um, both Jennifer and I agreed Beth would bring a breath of fresh air to a topic that has often been sort of worked over to death, and this is going to be a very different kind of critical intervention, I think. Uh, Beth is currently an associate professor of political science at Northwestern, although I believe her promotion to full is now in the bag. Is that correct? Okay. It's in process. It's, it's in process. Okay. So <laughs> it, it will be in the bag soon. Um, and she has, just briefly about her CV, she has two single authored books, um, The Politics of Secularism and International Relations, which came out in 2008, Princeton, and then her new book, which she's going to present today, Beyond Religious Freedom, The New Global Politics of Religion, also Princeton. Um, she has two co-authored, about co-edited books, and a bunch of refereed journal articles as well, in a actually quite a striking variety of journals. When I was looking over her CV, I was very impressed with you have articles in IR journals, religious studies, cultural studies, law journals, um, and beyond. So her work really is interdisciplinary in a way that is very unusual, I think, even for an IR scholar, at least nominally an IR person. Um, but I think that's one thing that I think marks Beth's, work, marks Beth's work as distinctive, at least within an IR context, which is that in IR, a lot of people have gotten on the religion and IR bandwagon ever since 9-11, because clearly religion suddenly matters. Um, but I think usually that work, at least the work that I've seen most of, amounts to uh, add religion as a variable and then stir. Okay? And as you'll see, Beth's work is nothing like that uh, at all. It's actually engaging different disciplinary audiences. She has her own agenda. She's not interested in adding variables and stirring. Um, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming um, Beth Hurd for Mershon. Okay. Thanks so much, Alex. It's really great to be here. Let me make sure that I've got my technology. Yay. Okay. We're good. Oh, now it's getting romantic. <laughs> this is my first visit to OSC. It's really, really great to be here. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Alex. So um, I will go straight to that slide, um, which is my first slide. I don't usually put long quotes up. I'll only do it twice today, so forgive me. Last summer, I read a book. Um, after my book came out, of course, this always happens. You, you, know, you, you finish it, it's done, you send it in, and then all of a sudden you're like, how come I didn't read this before my book came out? Well, this book is, is, call, is called All Can Be Saved. It's a, by Stuart Schwartz, who's an historian of colonial Latin America. And it's a fascinating, and I know, Alex, you like history, so you might like this one. It's a story of interreligious tolerance and boundary blurring coexistence, a dizzying coexistence in the Hispanic world in the 16th through 19th centuries. And near the end of his book, Schwartz sums up his approach to writing history. He says, one must go beneath the histories of state policies and religious dogmas that have dominated the writing of history. And one must look not primarily in learned discourse, which is often controlled, and at the policies of governments and kings, but in the actions and words of people who sought to think for themselves. My book, Beyond Religious Freedom, could be, one could say, addresses a parallel set of concerns in a very different setting. Today what I'm going to do is explain the backstory of the book, where it came from, and what it's trying to accomplish. The book asks scholars of religion and global affairs to consider what Schwartz would call the histories of learned discourse, or what I call expert religion, the policies of governments and kings, <clears throat> what I call official or governed, <clears throat> governed religion, and also, and critically, the actions of ordinary people, which I describe as lived or everyday religion. 
The book examines these fields, it examines their interactions, it examines the power dynamics through which they shape each other, and it examines their entanglements with the broader legal, economic, and political surroundings in which they're inter intertwined. I argue that religion simply cannot be isolated from the broader social and political fields in which it's embedded, nor can it be imagined as a variable and segregated cleanly from other dimensions of human sociality or history, as Alex said. In other words, there are no untouched religions that are sitting out there waiting to be studied, engaged, or reformed, or added and stirred, as the case may be. Religion, like gender, race, ethnicity, or class, is an intersected category and a complex one. I think much of IR has yet to catch up with this reality. So empirically, the book intervenes in contemporary international policy debates about rights, religion, and global politics. I examine a series of international religious reform projects, and I specifically describe them as religious reform projects, although that's not how they are described by the people promoting them, that have become very influential over the past few decades. I also examine the larger discursive apparatuses that sustain those projects. These are, first, legal guarantees for religious freedom, the political and religious empowerment of uh, religious leaders and representatives, and finally, protections for the rights of those described as religious minorities. And the politics, actually, we should be on this slide, the politics of how those minorities are designated, defined, and governed is an important part of the story that I won't go into at all today, but is part of uh, one of the chapters uh, that deals with the Alavi community of Turkey. And so I'm happy to talk more about specific examples, but I want to give you a kind of a bird's eye view of the argument. So each of these different projects that we see listed here is understood to be protecting often in law and through the law, the pre-existing rights, communities, and individuals that are religious. But as my earlier work in politics of secularism showed, this is untenable. The processes through which various activities and people are classified as either secular or religious are, of course, themselves highly politicized and deeply historically contingent. We have yet to fully recognize what this means for IR. Most IR scholars would probably agree that religion can't be ignored and it cannot be collapsed simply into other domains of social and political life. But recently, many of these same scholars seem to be drawn in a different and equally problematic direction, relying on a trans-historical and trans-cultural notion of religion as a freestanding descriptive and analytical category. And this is the problem that I'm working through and puzzling over in this book. We need, in other words, other ways to think about religion and politics between and beyond these two extremes. What would it mean to de-dramatize religion, neither absorbing it fully into the political nor allowing it to stand apart from history? What do we have locally, nationally, and internationally if we have neither religious freedom nor religion's complete absorption into the political? My book takes this approach, which you could call an integrationist approach perhaps, to the study of religion and politics forward to explore the specific kinds of religion and religious subjects that are created and then protected through particular governing arrangements, religious freedom, religious rights, religious toleration. As Matthew Scherer has shown in his new book, Beyond Church and State, the transformative processes that produced the notion of secularism understood as separation did not merely separate religion and politics, as we are often told, but rather redetermined the nature of both politics and religion simultaneously. Modern secularism, therefore, as Scherer himself argues, can be seen not simply to have emerged from a religious past with which it, is bro with which it has broken, but instead as both divided from a religious past and also locked in continuing and shifting patterns of interrelation with religion in the present. We know this now, there's been a lot of work on this topic, but despite the complexities of the secular religious binary, many contemporary governmental efforts depend on this stable rendering of the religious to solve policy challenges, those associated with the so-called religious sources of violence and those that require the irrenic qualities of religion, familiar to everyone as a source of community, as a source of freedom, as a source of morality. And this, of course, is where the book comes in, as a study, a critical exploration of these efforts and the assumptions about both religion and about politics that underlie them. So it's, a, it's simultaneously rethinking our understandings of both of these concepts and categories. So this is the slide we were supposed to be on. Um, I argue then, and this is sort of the 
quick and dirty version, that these arrangements, these governing arrangements, in fact help to generate and to create the very religious cleavages that they purport to transcend. So the book then is basically challenging the notion that the top-down legalization of freedom of religion, engagement with faith communities, and legal protections for religious minorities, um, are, that the, the it challenges the notion that this is the key to basically emancipating societies from all forms of violence and discrimination and persecution. So instead, what we see is that these efforts are generating or exacerbating social tensions. How? By making religious difference a matter of law and enacting a divide between the religion of those in power and the religion of those outside it or without it. So let me explain a little bit, and that's a very fast introduction to the book. It's a lot to take in. I think if I talk a little bit about how I came to this argument, it'll help you to understand where I'm going with it and why it's important. So the argument took shape as I was working through my own inability to reconcile what I was learning about religion from religious studies, on one hand, with the ways in which IR and many adjacent policy discussions that, uh, that are connected to IR were talking about religion. I just couldn't make sense, and I thought we needed a better bridge between these disciplines. So religious studies scholars, as many of you may know, are politicizing and historicizing world religions discourse, this idea that there are these things called religions, world religions out there that exist in some transhistorical essence outside of any political and legal context. While much of religious studies is taking a more critical and historical turn then, social scientists and policymakers were doing the exact opposite, embracing the world religions paradigm, designing modules, sophisticated measures and models, models and models and models to account for world religions alleged public and political salience, and then to better incorporate these pre-existing religions into global politics and public life. This is where the book came from. I saw this disconnect between these fields, between the field of religious studies and the field of IR poli sci. And it led me to a series of questions, and I want to just tell you some of those questions. Whose religion is actually being protected in efforts to promote religious freedom and rights? How should we conceive of the relation between the forms of religion that are privileged by these projects and the broader social, political, economic, legal fields in which they intervene? Who is actually authorized to speak on behalf of the religions and the religious people that populate our international faith-based policy landscape? And whom exactly are those representatives presumed to represent? So what happens to what we might call small r religion when big r religion is enshrined as a privileged category of legal go governmental knowledge action and advocacy? So if we unpack this small r big r distinction, it'll take you some way toward understanding the book. Winnie Sullivan has argued that human history supports the idea that small r religion is a nearly ubiquitous, maybe even necessary part of human culture. Big r religion, the religion protected in constitutions, the religion protected in international human rights law, and the religion of liberal political theory is not. Big r religion is a modern invention. It is designed to separate good religion from bad religion and orthodoxy from heresy. So what I'm doing in Beyond Religious Freedom, then, is trying to bring this approach to bear on a very specific moment in international history, which, was, which is our own moment, in which religion, as Alex said, is understood by many to have returned to IR, to public international life. And I write about a new public discourse on religion that has arisen. And by that, I mean a way of talking, thinking, and acting. And I call this the two faces of faith. Now, this term, the two faces of faith, is not my term. It comes from one of the main advocates of this approach, who is the fearless Tony Blair, who runs the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, and many of you may have come across the reams of publications that they have been producing in recent years. Now, the two faces approach has become very influential today among experts and government officials. What it does is it prescribes that good religion be restored to international affairs and bad religion be reformed, transformed, or eradicated. It's very simple, and that's why it's so powerful, because everyone gets it. This way of talking, I want to suggest, has largely displaced the conventional secularization thesis understood as the privatization or disappearance of religion in modernity. The displacement that we've seen, that we are seeing now, is complex and it's incomplete. And much more could be said. I'm trying to write a paper on this right now. 
But what we have in general is a shift <clears throat> excuse me, in public and academic discourse away from understanding religion as something private, internal, and irrelevant to global governance and toward a new model, a new dispensation, and new forms of both politics and religion. And that's really important because we're talking about mutually transform mutual transformations here. So in this new model, religion is a public good, an agent of transformation, and a source of both violence and freedom. And I'm hoping by now this is starting to sound familiar. This should be something you hear about every time you turn on the radio, the television, open the newspaper, talk to whomever. So let me say a quick word for anyone here who's interested in the politics of secularism. As a side note, both the older separationist narrative and the newer, what I call the restorative or recuperative narrative, can both be described as secularist. Defining and contesting what counts as religious are practices internal to secular politics. Matt Scherer says this differently, noting in his discussion of recent SCOTUS jurisprudence, it's a distinctly secular fiction that authorizes the autonomy of religion. Both of these narratives transform religion into an object of politics, whether to keep it out or bring it in. And both are deeply ensconced within the problem space of secularism. So moving away from that detour, let's look at the, the basic framework of the book for a few minutes, these three heuristics. Um, basically developed in order to help us understand and to critique the return of religion that I just described, this kind of binary good religion, bad religion story. So we have expert religion, which is religion as construed by those who generate policy relevant knowledge. There's a great demand for this now. We're talking here about policy experts, talking heads, scholars, government officials, you know the types. So in Europe and North America today, this field of knowledge production is dominated by what I call the two faces of faith, good religion, bad religion. The first face drives an agenda of reassurance, celebrating religion as a source of morality, cohesion, and freedom. The second face drives an agenda of surveillance, fearing religion as a danger to be reformed, transformed, and policed. This is how we were talking about religion in ex many expert circles today. Lived religion is small r religion, what I talked about a moment ago. This is religion as practiced by regular people as they interact with a variety of authorities, rituals, texts, and institutions, and try to make sense of their lives, basically, to navigate their lives on an everyday basis, their connections with others, their place in the world. This is a very diverse field. It's a field of various relations, investments, beliefs, and practices that is only sometimes captured in the set of goings-on that is called religion for the purposes of generating expert knowledge or for the purposes of governing. And this gap is important. So lived religion, I would suggest in the book, although I don't think I ever really say this, has been mostly ignored in IR. Um, and once we bring it into the picture, the politics of governing something called religion becomes enormously complex. And I think that's a good thing, because it is really messy and complex, or I would be out of a job. So the last category that I use is governed or official religion. Again, big R religion. Religion is as construed for the purposes of law and governance by those in positions of both political and religious authority. This includes states, we can think here of often through the law, think of how judges talk about religion, legal opinions, how they construe religion, and the various conceptions of religion that underlie and animate those opinions. But it also includes other authorities like courts, the EU, IOs, churches, and other religious organizations and hierarchies. So to be clear, these fields are all mixed up with each other, of course, as they are with institutional religion. So the distinctions are to some degree arbitrary between them. And they are themselves a product of law and governance. So there is no such thing as authentic lived religion that can be simply identified in any pure sense and then brought back in or reimported into politics and public life. There isn't any religion out there that's prior to structures and relations of power, history, and forms of normativity. So to suggest otherwise would be simply to reproduce the discourse that I'm politicizing and historicizing here. So what happens if, to the study of world politics if we disaggregate religion like that? We can see that the attitude that many IR scholars still take toward religion, treating it as if it were a discrete entity separate from politics, history, law, and so forth, produces a distorted understanding of politics, history, and law, not to mention religion. And particularly, the book focuses on the distortions in our understandings of efforts to promote religious freedom. It allows us to consider the politics of promoting religious freedom from a number of different vantage points, and I'm sure many of you could think of some that I didn't think of. Um, but for example, it allows us to think about these po the politics of promoting religious freedom from the vantage point of those who may dissent from the faiths that are being defined by faith or interfaith leaders, 
those whose spiritual practices don't conform to or even qualify as a religion worth protecting by those who write the laws or those who enforce them. Many what is so-called indigenous religions fall into this category. Another, I won't have time to go into that either, but happy to talk about it later. And those who fall into the gray areas between the secular religious divide, neither nor folks, that are enacted through these projects. So moving a bit closer to the ground, and with all of this as background, I want to turn for a few minutes to our current global political religio climate in which states and their proxies are working fast and furious to operationalize, not my word, their word, a particular form of expert religion, the promotion of good religion and the denigration of bad religion. How are they doing this through advocacy for freedom, rights, and toleration, as I said. So my intention in writing the book um, was to kind of climb into this worldview and to understand what was motivating people, what was going on, how are they thinking about religion, how are they thinking about politics. And I was pretty reticent to do so, and it was honestly a very uncomfortable process. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, it was sometimes quite stressful because I was mistaken to be an advocate and a lobbyist for religious freedom when I was really just trying to study uh, this whole movement and this whole, uh, all of the sort of the discourse of religious freedom advocacy. Now, the view inside from the good religion, bad religion worldview is a really familiar place, um, it turns out, in which the U.S. and our allies today are rallying around this idea that legal guarantees to ensure minority rights, the flourishing of free religion, are an absolute requirement to emancipate societies from economic deprivation, from terrorism, gender inequality, you know the list. So moderate religion will push back and ultimately triumph over its intemperate rivals. The right kind of religion, when engaged by states, and other public authorities will have emancipatory potential. It will catalyze democratization, it will take the wind out of the sails of extremist movements, and therefore states and everybody needs to promote religious freedom and moderation. And this is not only the U.S., of course, it's Canada as well. It's the, Canada is now, of course, kind of debating whether it should continue this. We talked about it in the class I talked this morning, whether they should keep going or not with Trudeau in power is now up for grabs, and we'll see what happens there. Um, but the U.N., many NGOs, uh, the EU has been very big on this. So leaders, again, they see this cultivation of tolerant religion as the key to addressing the ills that are plaguing us today in global collective life. In the U.S., I want to emphasize that there's a bipartisan consensus around this. So this is not, um, it is not only evangelicals, it's not only Republicans. Um, President Obama, speaking at the 2014 National Prayer Breakfast, made a statement to the effect that uh, history shows that nations upholding the rights of their people, including the freedom of religion, are more just, more peaceful, and more successful. If freedom of religion matters to our national security, I won't give you the whole quote. As you might imagine, I tell a very different story. I argue that advocacy for legal guarantees, very specifically legal guarantees of religious freedom, tolerance, and the rights of religious minorities are specific, historically contingent political forms for managing and constructing uh, diverse populations. So today, those in positions of power are subscribing to, adopting, and adapting these forms. So they're very familiar to us. They seem natural. They seem normal. They seem inevitable. You could think of them as kind of like the default screensaver when you get a new computer, and that's what there is. And if you just turn it on, you're stuck with it unless you change it. That's the way it is with these. This is what you do. There's a global demand for tolerant religious subjects who enjoy their freedom under law. And you know, individual and collective lives are being tailored by a small army of professionalized religion experts and governors all over the world. Individuals and communities on the ground are understood to be in need of various degrees of social and religious engineering. And so reformers are sent out to cultivate the social and the legal conditions in which secular states and their religious subjects become tolerant, believing or non-believing consumers of free religion, practitioners of faith-based solutions, and there is an enormous amount of resources actually going into this, people gathering information, they're training their bureaucrats on how to achieve these objectives and how to cultivate particular kinds of religious and political subjects. So what is, why does this matter? What are the consequences of privileging these particular political forms from governing social diversity in both foreign and international affairs? Why do we care? How should we interpret efforts to treat religion as a stable category, a platform for policy innovation? Whose religion has returned exactly? And how do these projects impact the lives of those they claim to want to protect or redeem? So I think that focusing, this is where focusing on lived, governed, and expert religion gives us a way in, allowing us to distinguish between religious freedom as legalized, defined, and authorized by experts and governments on the one hand, and the broader fields in which those constructs are brought to life or materialized on the other. So efforts to govern religion from above can't simply be equated with or assumed to be uh, equivalent to the diverse ways of life on the ground. 
So there, again, there are no pure religions that stand prior to or outside of history, but instead religious practices unfold amid all domains of human life around the world, forms of belonging, work, play, governance, violence, exchange. And what we need to do, I think, to understand this is to dethrone religion as a stable, coherent, legal, and policy category. Much easier said than done, it turns out, as I've been learning over the past seven years. So what this does then, it, we, in terms of this, uh, the current wave of international religious pro religion programming or religious programming that we're seeing, is it gives us a little bit of a new perspective. We can see that this wave of programming is in fact expert and official religion of a very particular kind. We've seen in, re in recent years the rise of an insatiable appetite for knowledge about religion, religious leaders and politics and policies, and indeed a host, an array of experts have emerged happily to meet the demand. As you know, academic journals are overrun with studies of religion, the analyses of the effects of religious actors and belief systems on political outcomes are ubiquitous. Foundations and think tanks are rushing to meet the demand for knowledge about religion. Solutions for anxious policymakers are being sought and found. The security industry, environmentalists, and rule of law consultants are all searching for ways to bring religion back in. And much of this expertise is being presented as this corrective to an alleged secularist bias, both in the academy but also in government circles. And this impulse then goes hand in hand with the marginalization of whomever is identified as secular or secularist. So in this view, if governments can do this right, if they can shape religion and engage religious actors in the right way, Religion will save the day. Good religion will bring peace and security and economic prosperity and so on. But I think this narrative itself is a very particular and provincial, really, form of expert knowledge. It is very powerful, however, and I, I'm afraid it's captured a lot of the field of IR. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Religion then is seen as a potential problem, cause of violence and discord, and at the same time as its own solution, right? If we can harness its benevolent tendencies for the public good. And in this, you know, I have this quote here, it's long from Martin Stringer, but other people have, have, have noted this, wor kind of world religions discourse on steroids. And Martin Stringer put his finger on it a few years ago talking about uh, specifically looking at the sociological and political science literature, and he just says that from those perspectives, the debate about religious diversity assumes there are these things called religions out there, they're interacting. And when we explore in more detail what these things called religions are, in most cases people assume a religion is a group of people who share a common belief system, engage in a common set of rituals, and that these people see their religion as a central element of their own identity. So they identify themselves as Christian, as Buddhist, whatever. Almost all authors working in this field, he said, assume that religions are a social fact and that the question is how do they or should they interact. So in contemporary IR, and here I'm talking about both the production of knowledge in the social sciences and its application, religions are being seen as unproblematic social facts in this way that are comprised of bounded entities and hierarchical faith communities that need to be studied, engaged, and reformed and brought back into public life. How do we see it differently? From the perspective of my book, we can ask, how is this particular form of expert religion shaping real-world global politics? And one example I want to give is this construct this concept of religious violence, which is doing so much work right now in the world. In the book, I talk about the plight of the Rohingya, which is a population of around 800,000 people living um, mainly in northwestern Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. And the Rohingya are often described um, as a persecuted religious minority who suffer from religious violence at the hands of a Buddhist majority. And indeed, since 1982, the Burmese state has excluded the Rohingya, denied them citizenship, even though many of them, or most of them, have lived in that region for centuries. There have been large-scale government crackdowns with names like Operation Dragon King in 1978 and Operation Clean and Beautiful Nation in 1991. So many of the Rohingya were pushed out, many of them fled. You've probably heard about this in the news. Um, they're being persecuted by the state, by nationalist Buddhist monks, and by many others. Now, religion, and I'm going to have to skip over a lot of the details, this is in the book, but just to give you a, a quick sense of this argument, religion and religious identity bear a very heavy explanatory load in accounts of the Rohingya's persecution and explanations for why the people are being persecuted. So we're told by the international media that they're a Muslim minority suffering from religious persecution at the hands of an intolerant Buddhist majority. The people of Myanmar are intolerant, we're told, and religious discrimination accounts for the violence. Myanmar, then, is incompletely secularized in the sense that intolerant forms of religion are stubbornly persisting in public life. Intolerant religion, of course, is said to cause the persecution and the violence. And this sets up religious freedom and guarantees for religious minorities as the solution. But 
in fact, on the ground, thinking and reading as much as I could about this particular conflict and this uh, pattern of discrimination and exclusion, the comprehensive exclusion of the Rohingya from Burmese state and society, it's clear that patterns of authority, sociability, and institutional power that do not themselves distinguish cleanly between political, economic, and religious domains have all worked together to enable the exclusion of the Rohingya. The discrimination against them then is not only religious, it is also ethnic, racial, economic, status, and post-colonial. And while each of these factors is of course entangled with religious institutions and histories and authorities, none can be reduced to them. If we try to do so, we don't see clearly. This obscures the historical, the geographic, and the economic forces that are all complicit in their marginalization. So to see this conflict this way does more than correct our vision. It also allows us to see the kind of backflow process, and that I think is an important aspect of the argument that I want to get to here, and that is that efforts to protect the Rohingya as a Muslim minority in law actively redetermine or reshape both religion and politics simultaneously. So these are productive forms of discursive power, in, other, in IR terms. When the media, advocacy groups, and the religious freedom lobby depict them as persecuted Muslims, they in fact reinforce an exclusionary nationalist narrative of Buddhist nationalism, which is premised on a hierarchical Buddhist-Muslim hierarchy of dis difference in which the Buddhists are the real, the real citizens and the Muslims are excluded. They're inauthentic, they're fake, they need to be kicked out. A main supporter of this narrative, for example, is 969. Some of you may have heard of them, the Buddhist Monks Organization, which has famously called for the ethnic and religious cleansing of, uh, of, the, of Myanmar. So 969 speak of hard and fast lines dividing Muslims from Buddhists. They posit strong connections between majoritarian constructions of Buddhism, race, and the Burmese nation. So public and legal discourse that reinforces the Rohingya status as a Muslim minority entrenches the divide between Muslims and Buddhists, and re as religious difference becomes a matter of law and public recognition. This not only sidelines the Rohingya who are not Muslim, but it also sidelines side those who choose not to speak as Muslims. So in other words, it forces the Rohingya to only speak as Muslims or not to speak at all. So there's very important exclusionary forms of politics going on here. The, the Rohingya, are, their status as outsiders is cemented and this basically feeds ex very exclusionary forms of both politics and religion. We can't separate them. So are the Rohingya being persecuted because they're Muslims? because they're seen as immigrants and outsiders, or because they're perceived as threatening the economic interests of the former junta. All of the above, probably. The former junta, in fact, this narrative would suggest that I'm telling, may be supporting the religious persecution narrative in the international media that's propagating it to distract attention from their own complicity in casting out the Rohingya. To see this requires that we take a more integrative approach to religion and politics in which both fields and the boundaries between them themselves become part of our object of inquiry, and this is how my work goes. So to reduce the Rohingya's plight to a problem of religious violence is to force their much larger and more complex history into the problem space of secularism. It obscures the bigger picture and, perhaps more importantly, it shapes realities on the ground. By politicizing religious difference, it exacerbates polarization and violence. And this relates to the second observation and how we see things differently. I'll just give you these three examples after the book. So when IR folks and policymakers approach world religions as entities with agency that are subject to public oversight, those entities start to become real. They start to take shape in precisely that way. There's, we could call this a backflow or backstreaming process. To put it in IR theory terms, the new global politics of religion is a productive form of power that is shaping the lives of those who live under its legal and discursive designations and authorizations. It's a lot of big words. Protecting individuals, communities, traditions as religions reshapes both politics and religion. So today, and you can see this everywhere, I'll give you an example, groups and people around the world are being compelled to represent themselves and their practices as recognizably religious. Why? Because they need to do so in order to gain aid to access to asylum, legal protection, and other social goods. People who can't or choose not to do so become illegible or invisible under these regimes. So given the incentives to identify yourself in a recognizably religious register, faith communities are starting to take shape as corporate bodies in international public space, reaping the benefits of being classified as religions, as faith communities, and as persecuted religionists. There are so many interesting examples of how this backstreaming process is working. Sudanese refugees in Egypt explained to my colleague Melanie McAllister, for example, that, quote, being a persecuted Christian was a good idea if you want to get asylum status or help from UN programs, end quote. We also see these dynamics right now in claims for asylum in Germany. 
because asylum claims coming from Pakistani Christians are carrying much more weight legally and politically. There's been a big uptick in conversions to Christianity among asylum seekers. So both politics and religion are being transformed in ways that cannot be fully disentangled uh, as a result of the privileging of religion as a legal category in these circumstances. So another payoff of this argument is we can start to ask some new questions, hopefully. So scholars of religion and politics can now consider the gap between the religion that's authorized or privileged legally and politically and the worlds of everyday belonging and belief. Many forms of everyday ordinary religion fit uncomfortably into an understanding of religion as a cause of political behavior. Many fail to conform to orthodox understandings of what religion is. An example, and I won't make it long, are Afro-Brazilian practices. In Brazil, as some of you may know, aspects of both candomblé and umbanda have long been part of Brazilian culture. Millions of Brazilians offer flowers to the sea goddess Yamanja, who is associated with the Virgin Mary and kind of inseparable on New Year's Eve and on February 2nd. Candomblé has a sister religion, umbanda, which combines candomblé with Catholic traditions and saints. It's all blended together. Umbanda ceremonies feature the drumming and the incorporation scene in candomblé, but worshipers are also saying pra Catholic prayers at the same time. So writing in Boston Review, Laura Premack, who's a scholar of Brazilian religion, describes this as spiritual bricolage, a term that I used earlier. It's a little bit corny and annoying, but it kind of gets the point across. So Premack says, it's unsurprising to meet a Brazilian who calls herself Catholic, belonged to an evangelical youth group as a teenager, was married by a priest, attends a local Methodist church, reads spiritist books, draws mandalas to relax, and consults an Umbanda priest for advice when she needs it. This is the religion of much of the world. Whether in Brazil, the US, Japan, or Albania, it's often very difficult to categorize individuals as believers or non-believers in a single world religion. Today's efforts to promote religious freedom, and we can see, always single out specific forms of religion, specific religious leaders, and particular traditions from a more expansive, messy, multi-form, bricolaged field. The religion that gets privileged through freedom and rights will rarely, if ever, align with these more improvised forms of ordinary belonging. What happens is that dissidents, doubters, those who practice multiple traditions, non-orthodox versions of protected traditions, or no recognizable tradition at all, will struggle for air on a faith-based global landscape that privileges US and European friendly religions and their anointed and appointed representatives. Stephen Colbert calls it the American faithscape. He's got a really funny one on this that if I had more time I would show you, but that's, you guys can Google it. So what can it possibly mean to secure something called international religious freedom in this context? I'm hoping that we'll walk out of the room without a good answer to that. Forms of sociality and religiosity, such as the, those which fall under the umbrella of indigenous religion, easily escape the field of vision of scholars who are trained to study big R religion. This, of course, includes most scholars of IR, it includes a lot of legal scholars. It includes a lot of law professors. Most law professors, I would venture to say. When we look for religion, when they look for religion, we tend to look for religious leaders and institutions. We tend to look for texts. We look for orthodoxies. We look for authorities, usually men wearing robes and fancy hats. These people matter, but they don't exhaust the field. So. Privileging religion as the category of governance and law will always privilege some practices, orthodoxies, and authorities over others. And rather than a stable norm that's simply awaiting globalization, we can now see religious freedom as a specific form of governance spearheaded by those in positions of political and religious authority in various contexts. To deploy religious rights will have specific kinds of consequences. And this, this is interesting to think about in the US domestic context as well. I gave a version of this talk a couple weeks ago in Indiana, and they were really interested given what's going on there. So what happens when you deploy religious rights is that you increase the public salience of whatever the legal authorities define as religion right, as a matter of social difference. So this requires those authorities, like we're talking about the courts, right, the judges, to determine what counts as religion and then to distinguish between orthodox and unorthodox forms of it. This pressures states and courts to govern their citizens as religious subjects. And not only does this exclude the non-religious then, which of course it does, which matters, but it also contributes to the tensions these efforts are meant to mitigate. Why? Because it hardens more fluid lines of difference between and within groups. It foments intracommunal conflict. And it often inserts, as I've learned in my, my uh, collective project, an international dimension into local matters that could have been settled more peaceably. So my colleagues in the Politics of Religious Freedom Project have documented this around the world in places like so post-Soviet Central Asia, Malaysia, South Sudan, India, and elsewhere. And we have a book called Politics of Religious Freedom with 29 really short essays. This is the ad part, you know, that 
uh, really short essays, no footnotes. We banned footnotes from all contributors. So it's a quick read and it'll give you a kind of a, like a wine flight sample of the politics of religious freedom around the world. So, so, that, so f we have to think about the freedom differently. We also have to think about government-sponsored religious engagement programs differently. And this is not something I assume everyone's familiar with, but religious outreach, religious engagement has become kind of the new um, hip thing. It may recently have been overtaken by countering violent extremism. But these programs, we have to understand that in these programs, religious groups are taking shape simultaneously as political actors and as faith communities. So we assume that they're just out there waiting to be engaged, but that in fact is not the case. They are in fact being constructed both politically and as faith communities through this process of a religious engagement. People assume that they have these clearly defined orthodoxies, that they have peaceable spokesmen that will come forward, and most of them are men. Religious engagement officers love this stuff. They talk to me about it endlessly in Brussels and Washington. They think, oh, finally, we've got partners. We've been waiting for them. It's the peaceful religions. Now we can work with them and we can fix everything. But of course the problem is, and this is what they don't want to hear, there is no set of religions, as I've been saying, waiting in the wings to be engaged. So that which falls under the heading of religion is a contested and shifting mashup of various families of beliefs, institutional forms, and fields of practice and experience. What state-sponsored religious outreach does is very specific. It forcibly distills that field into something governable often in line with U.S. interests, not surprisingly. It squeezes this diverse set of goings on into the mold of whatever's defined as religion that merits engagement. That religion gets a seat at the table. The, the, I can tell you examples. The, uh, our former ambassador at large for U.S. religious freedom, um, Suzanne Johnson, actually just will just tell you this. She says the U.S. has muscle. We need to use it to support religious leaders. So what this does, of course, is it creates a divide between official sanctioned religion and then the rest of the world's religion, including those that don't qualify as a religion and those that are associated with political opponents and dissidents. So this is a form of politicizing religion in a very particular way. So I'm going to wrap up here. Many of, uh, maybe not you, many of you probably, many that I meet um, as I go around, counter, look, claims made, claims for justice that are made in the language and the register in the discourse of religious freedom are powerful. They resonate. They matter. They make a difference. Why should people give them up? Should people give them up? So it's clear that this new global politics of religion rewards those who speak its language. And I am not denying that. It's important to understand that. It compels individuals and groups with multiple and intersecting identities and histories to register and to constitute themselves publicly and politically as tolerant, freedom-loving faith communities. People have every incentive to do so today. Rather than judge them, however, my aim to sum up here is to explain to people in positions of power that on the religionized global landscape that we are creating, those who cannot or choose not to speak in a recognizably religious register will not be heard. This includes many scholars. For in addition to ordinary people who are subject to these legal and discursive regimes, many of us academics have also been swept up in a well-funded infrastructure of what I sometimes call the global religion industrial complex, but not in the book. So countering violent extremism programming is the best example of that. So at best, the new global politics of religion distracts us from efforts to address the causes of violence and the causes of discrimination and persecution through initiatives that would support education, economic opportunity, open societies, and just governance. At worst, it politicizes religious difference and foments the radicalization it is intended to prevent. In either case, it lends authority and authenticity to groups designated as religions. It confers social and political agency on them. It naturalizes boundaries between religions and between religion and non-religion. And as a result, new corporate forms of religious agency, hierarchy, and authority are taking shape and defending their ground. We're seeing that today, and if you watch the, the, what's happening with the Supreme Court, old hierarchies are being reasserted with great power. So looking ahead, one challenge I'll just conclude by saying is to create space for those who might resist this gravitational pull of the new global politics of religion. Sorry to go so fast. There's the book covers. That's my book. That's the collective volume that I was talking to you about. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you all. Hi, Isaac. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Yeah, ooh.
wonder how the foreign policy of religion could be associated with national security. And has it just been folded in into the internal policing of this community? Yes, it's all part of the same set of programming. So in the UK, the prevent program you have in mind, probably? Or did you have a dis I mean, the program's based on the radicalization. Uh, yeah. So they're all, they're all part of the same family of programs, and they're often the same individuals who are consulting and who are involved in the sort of uh, domestic policing of various you know, Muslim minorities and also this kind of external face. The UK, it's interesting, has been um, slightly less proactive on the external side, but very active internally, which is interesting to think about. I don't know all of the reasons for that. Um, part of it may have to be with a general kind of recent, or not so recent, allergy to the EU. So they've been kind of less involved than you might expect in some of the Brussels initiatives. So taking the lead in Brussels, which has been um, kind of the center for a lot of this programming, in the EU external uh, relations, has been, you know, the UK has not been taking the lead in that. That's been much more, I would say, um, of a French, uh, German, and Nordic um, set of partners that are concerned with that. So the UK tends to be a little bit um, sidelined. But, but yes, this is all part of the same picture. I didn't go into, I do talk a little bit in the book about Prevent, I think in one of the notes, and I talk about, there's been some interesting work by Peter Edge looking at these programs. There's been a lot of great work on this, as you know, I'm sure. Um, so I don't, there's one, one challenge and one shortcoming, you could say, of the book probably, is that I'm very much focused on a very specific tranche of this programming, which is the kind of the externally focused programs, because if I were to do both, it would have been 500 pages long. But it's absolutely the same kind of uh, discursive regime that's governing, you know, both inside and outside, and a lot of the same folks and the same policies and the same kind of, uh, yeah, the same mindsets that are prevailing in both. So, is that is that what you had in mind, or do you, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I'm really refreshed by your take, which, for a critical perspective, is surprisingly engaging with the policy community. Um, but I wonder, um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how to sketch out a research program for talking about world religion in a way that doesn't reinforce the discourses that set yeah. the official and, uh, uh, from the real religion. And what are your thoughts on how to move forward in research, not just engaging with policy community? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, and I mean, to be clear, my interest is not in engaging with the policy community quite explicitly. My interest was to understand this much, not only the policies, but the, the the discursive apparatus, the worldviews that are making possible these particular understandings and kind of enabling particular forms of both politics and religion and public policies to, to shape and to address this issue. Two answers. One is, you know, that's already out there is to look at the collective, the edited volume, because there, and these are short essays and you're not, you don't need to read them all, but you can get a sense of these uh, various approaches. There's not one approach, there's not one research program that I want to get behind. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of different approaches depending on your discipline, depending on your orientation. Some of the scholars who contribute this volume are legal anthropologists. Uh, others are experts in particular in, in religious studies. Others um, work, you know, in law. And it really depends on, you know, your, your methodology and your approach is going to depend on your disciplinary orientation and the audience for your work. So there isn't one research program, there are many going forward. But um, in terms of where I'm headed and where my own work is headed, my own sort of general orientation to give you the two second version, is to really think about um, using the words secularism and religion in very different ways so that we, we're not going to get rid of them because they're obviously powerful words, they're doing a lot of work. I don't want to suggest that we can no longer use these words, but we need to use them differently. We need to be much more conscious. We need to explain our way as we go, what we mean and why we're using this term now. And I also think it's helpful to try to always keep in the back of our mind that when we're using these terms, that we, 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 there's the possibility of, of, of pulling it apart, right? And doing, you know, for example, in this context, I do the expert and govern and live sort of differentiation. In another context, there might be a different way of breaking things down to sort of disaggregate this category of religion, which I think is doing a tremendous amount of work, and it's not always particularly helpful work, either analytically or politically. And those are, things don't always go together for me, right? So I'd be happy to talk more. This is a question I get from all the really smart grad students. And they say, well, you know, give us a research program. This is something I am I'm toying with trying to write a paper that would articulate one possibility. But I am very hesitant to sort of go in that prescriptive direction. It's a real challenge that I, I really appreciate you raising that. I'm happy to talk more. Um, yes. I'm not sure you guys who was next, but we'll get to you, Jennifer. <laughs>
Where? Sorry, where is this that you're talking about? Where? Here in the U.S.? Really? Where? They're not, no one's getting any sort of freedom in Egypt right now. Egypt is a dictatorial disaster right now. No one's getting any sort of freedom, whether you're a religious minority or anybody else. Right? So, let me be clear about that. Right. Well, I, okay. But, yeah, okay. You know, Paul Sedra's done a lot of really interesting writing. We have a piece in this volume actually on the question of the, the relationship between the Coptic Church and the Coptic laity in Egypt, which is just fascinating. And it shows a lot of the tensions that were and remain um, in place as a result of the kind of understanding, you could say, between Mubarak and the church that evolved over the course of many decades and involved a certain kind of silencing of much of the Coptic laity. And what we saw in the revolution in Egypt, which of course ended up failing tragically, was that a lot of the Coptic youth in particular in the laity were breaking away from the church and breaking away f and dissenting from the church at, and, its own, and its ability to speak in, for their interests as they had historically done vis-a-vis -vis the state for many, many decades. And that movement and that moment and those politics, those oppositional politics, were often invisible to us because we had, vi we had visualized and understandably the Coptic church as a kind of unitary actor and the church leadership as speaking on behalf of the church and all of the, the laity. And in fact, it never did. And then there was always these powerful dissenting currents, which became very clear in the course of the revolution because they began to speak out. And there's some, been some fabulous work on this lately that I'd be happy to send your way, not mine, other people's. Um, but I hear what you're, what you're, what you're talking about here is, is also really this question of secularism. And that's something that um, I think there's been a tremendous amount of very rich work that is getting to some of the very points that you're making on the, the politics of how states that understand themselves to be secular are in fact th themselves uh, creating, construing, governing, overseeing, and regulating religion in various spaces and places. And that varies according to time and place. They're not all the same model. But there is a sense in which there, the sort of myth of separation was never actually, you know, it was really just that. It was a myth. It was a story that the secular and the secular state and the, told about itself. It was a claim to the secular, which itself is a very powerful claim, and it does a lot of work, and it enacts particular kinds of politics and religion, which is the Matt Scherer's point that I was making in the early part of the talk. At the same time, we can also pull back from that and understand and see some of the uh, some of the blind spots, you could say, and some of the limitations of those construals, um, including the, the idea that there is such a thing as the Coptic Church, which has an understanding with the Egyptian state, which is you know, just a settled fact, and opening that up and seeing some of the mechanisms of governance and the uh, forms of opposition inside the Coptic uh, Church itself is a, one potential avenue into kind of troubling this idea that we have this thing called the secular state that just you know, does X, Y, and Z in Egypt or anywhere else. Does that, does that get to some of what you're saying, or you have, it looks like you have something else in mind? No, it's fine. Great, thank you. Jennifer and then Alex. Um, I want to just go back to the Jane's question uh, before. I don't really see how a lot of the effects are going to be from another restaurant, which is, I mean, I've written down that you know, this is a good religion going on. So, how should we be looking at this religion? It's interesting to hear Anthony Jane was about breaking down the categories through which from the top down we're talking about them. And I agree that's an important step. But once we say, okay, let's shift our gaze, Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to hear you 
Oh, that's a great question. So I, again, there's probably not going to be one single answer, but actually thinking back to this, the forms of, um, well, going, I mean, we could talk about the cops. We could talk about those dynamics that I was just talking about as one example, um, opening up spaces um, within what are perceived to be kind of closed, bounded, hierarchical, orthodox communities and understanding the um, variety, the descent, the currents, the change, the shifts, and the, um, you know, constantly shifting landscape within them is one part of it. Um, understanding kind of what I was talking about when I mentioned the example from Brazil, the hybridity, the spiritual bricolage, the kind of improvised nature of many people, many modern religious lives all over the world is another aspect that I think it's really important to start grappling with. What does that mean for how we talk about um, religion in you know, and when we're talking about law and governance and the state and IR. Um, I'm not sure what, it's not going to mean the same thing in every context, but it's going to force us to ask a different set of questions and to be much more self-conscious when we use the term, I think. Um, what are we talking about when we talk about religion? Who's religion? How are we defining that? How are we thinking about that? Um, in terms of thinking about, uh, another way to take this, though, would be to think about questions of global public policy. And one of the things that's come up over and over today um, in my discussions with people, and that's been coming up a lot in some of the recent writing I've been trying to do, is uh, you know questions of uh, official, the, the Genocide Convention, for example. So if you look at any international legal instruments that are going to single out, in this case, religion alongside other factors, race, ethnicity, et cetera, um, as protected categories, what are the politics of that? And if you bring an, the framework of this book to bear on a critical reading of the Genocide Convention, I think that it sheds a different kind of light and it calls into question in very particular ways um, the, 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 what we're actually doing when we protect, when we declare officially a genocide, in fact, in the Middle East right now in Syria, you know, ISIS against the Christians and the Yazidis and this whole sort of complex that's now coming up and becoming very politically uh, relevant. Every time I turn around, I'm being asked about this, which is why I'm bringing it up. So I think that we can rethink and reread a, a series of international legal instruments, conventions, and norms, and practices that rely on a stable, or a presumed stable and um, unified understanding of this thing called religion, as if it's just out there, and say, look, wait, this is, this isn't, this is actually, it's not only misrepresenting the world and obscuring a lot of other factors and forces that are out there in the case of declaring genocide, I would argue, but it's also in this kind of backstreaming and backflow process, helping to produce some of the very um, communal divisions and divides that it's in, in, in an effort to protect them. And so I think that it's a very complex dynamic. And I actually have just, like I said, I was just, just finished writing a, it's just a chapter for an edited volume. It's nothing big, but I'm going to have to build this out because it's really important, I think, in the context of this um, frenzy, which is understandable, to try to protect vulnerable communities in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere around the world. I mentioned the Rohingya, for example, and there are many, unfortunately, examples, um, that there's, there is a certain rush to, um, to find the solution and to find that solution in international law and you know, among many human rights advocates, for example, and also among many advocates for um, Christians in the Middle East. There's a whole series of groups. There are eight or 10 groups that are sponsoring the legislation that's being marked up this week um, in the House. This is sponsored by Fortenberry from Nebraska, I think, and, and co-sponsored in the Senate by Marco Rubio. And um, they're you know, working fast and furious to, to mark up this legislation and get it to the floor. So I think it's really important that as this process unfolds, that we think very critically about what exactly we're doing when we um, say that there is, we declare officially that there's a genocide, that these groups are going to be protected. Um, so that means that if you're a Christian and you have a barrel bomb dropped on you by Assad, you're, you're, that violence is going to be declared you know, of a special nature, of especially bad, particularly pernicious, and that person needs to be protected. If you're a Sunni and you're in Aleppo and you have a barrel bomb dropped on your head by Assad, it's just too bad because you're just a political opponent. You're not, you're not protected. So we're privileging particular, you know, ascribed identities in this case. Um, and what happens to the people who have mixed, you know, whose father is Sunni and their mother is Shia or mother is Christian and father is Ali? You know, I mean, these, these sorts of things I think are just, there's just not a level of sophistication um, that is going into the thinking that underlie the assumptions of these conventions. And I'm afraid that they're, they may actually lead to, in this case, uh, for lack of a better word, exculpatory politics of the Assad regime and the violence that it's perpetrating against all kinds of people, Christian and others, 
um, with, this, with a single-minded focus on rescuing Christians and naming that particular violence perpetrated by ISIS, which is admittedly horrific, upon the Christians and the Yazidis. So it's a, it's a question of deflecting attention away from a much broader field of violence and from the arguably the, you know, statistically the worst perpetrator of that violence right now, which is Bashar al-Assad by a long shot. And I've got statistics and stuff on that. I don't know if that's a different talk, but I'd love to, I'd love to think more of this. That's just one quick example. There's probably a number of others if I were to talk about it. Thanks, Alex. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, but then we're left with 7 billion different lived experiences of religion. And I guess I wonder what one does with that politically and epistemically. That's just a comment. I guess I, mean, I welcome your reactions to that. The question I wanted to pose is since I'm the resident person who's not really as critical as I should be when I'm talking to my We can't. Well, okay, but I get the sense that you don't want to um, institutionalize protections, minority religious protections. Right. Okay, but that's not abandoning law. Okay. Well, it's not possible. Okay. I wouldn't want to go that far. <laughs> Yeah. So my point is not only that the genocide convention isn't doing the work that it should do, but that it's actually making matters much, much worse. Okay. So with the protections for religion, and that requires a lot of unpacking. That you know, I started to do in response to Jennifer's question, and I'll have to do more. But I'm not going to do it here. It would take too long. But so I'm not trying. I don't want to suggest we have we're going to abandon law. I don't think that's possible, right? I mean, that's it's un, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that. I am saying that the category of religion is simply too unstable to bear the kind of weight that we're asking it to bear when we construct it in use it in legal and governmental contexts, and that we are going to end up in, in immediately discriminating when we do that. Well, I don't think there is a you know there isn't going to be we're not going to just substitute culture. Right? right yeah. I mean, that was just going to replicate, right? We're not going to have religious freedom 2.0, and it's better now because we have a different word. No, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the answer. So, I mean, this is part of the question of what, what is the role, what is my role here as a scholar, and what is the role of a critical scholar? What is the role of, you know, are, am I supposed to give an alternative solution? I think that we would be better off if we rewrote the First Amendment. Yeah. And if we got rid of legal protections for, religious, for religion and religious freedom, and we based our collective existence on notions of equality instead. I think that because of the history of the term itself, it, is, um, it has a very complex history. It has a very complex genealogy um, in the history of you know, church-state relations in Europe, um, a very complex relation to the politics of modernity globally, and the projection of various forms of European power. This has been documented by people like David Chittister, for example, uh, and that ultimately I think we need to find some other ways of talking about how we live together and, and legalizing and constitutionalizing um, how, thinking about how we live together that don't necessarily rely on legal instantiations of religion, which are going to be inherently discriminatory and exclusionary. That's where, I, that's where if you want to push me to the end of like the sort of prescriptive or normative side, that's probably where I end up. 
But it's, I mean, of course, it's not going to happen. I mean, that's, we're not going to get rid of it. And when I say get rid of it, I'm also talking in very, very narrow and specific sense in that I'm not talking about not using the term, as I said in response to your question. I mean, this is ridiculous. The term is, is real and it's important and it's, it's organizing, you know, production of knowledge. It's organizing how people understand themselves and each other. But we can, so that's not on the table. But what is on the table is to think very carefully when it's used in governmental and legal contexts and the kind of work it's doing, particularly the kind of exclusionary work it's doing. So I think that's what we need to be much more cognizant of and much more careful about as we think about this. Um, that's probably not going to give you a, what you're looking for. <laughs> You've got to think about it. We've got to think about it. We've got to think hard about what it's doing and what kind of uh, protections it's giving to whom on what grounds and what kind of possibilities it's creating and stamping out. So there's someone behind you with his hand up. Please. Right. Right. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have a category. I'm saying that we're not fully understanding, and I'm talking really about understanding the consequences of these categories, not only in obscuring how we understand the world when we over-rely on these categories, but also in how they're actively shaping political and religious realities on the ground. So there's an interaction between, it's not merely that there's a mismatch, there's always going to be a mismatch. I couldn't agree more, and that's fine, and it's normal. But that there are, that there are dynamics, right? That the, the law actively shapes and constructs religion. It creates subjects, right? And that to be, of course, of course it is. But I think that there's, I don't think people fully understand, though, the kind of work that's being done by these categories, by this particular category. And if you think about, we went back, you know, talking about the Genocide Convention. Um, if you think about that, what kinds of violence then are being uh, sort of identified and singled out as particularly nefarious and particularly problematic? It's violence against these particular people are defined in a particular way by someone, whereas other forms of violence against political opponents, against people who may have mixed backgrounds and don't qualify for some reason because of the slipperiness and the contentiousness of this category, are going to be simply ignored or, you know, deprivileged or seen as less significant from an international legal and political standpoint in terms of how the international community wants to respond to this crisis. Those, those kinds of questions, I think, are not questions that we're able to ask unless we take a a, an approach that destabilizes our understanding of religion. I'm not saying that it's going, that we're not going to get rid of it, that we're going to somehow fix it all. I am saying that we can ask different kinds of questions and we can see uh, important aspects of political, social, and religious reality that, that are not accessible if we, if we stick to a very narrow understanding of the term. I think it needs to be opened up in, in some of the ways and disaggregated. So I, does that, 
And that might only, again, like Alex might only get halfway. But I'm not, I'm, I think we need to understand better what we're doing when, we're, when this term is being used in the, in the context in which it's being used. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. It's kind of all of the above in the sense that it's not new um, with 9-11, and that's, you probably noticed the subtitle is the new global politics of religion. It's not new. The subtitle's wrong. Um, it's, it's not new at all. And in fact, in the book, I say that it's not new, that it's uh, probably all forms of governance, even before the rise of the state, various imperial formations and so on and so forth, have, as long as there's been a religious field to intervene in, they've been intervening in it and trying to shape it. So in that sense, nothing's new under the sun. On the other hand, there has been, I think, an acceleration of, you know, of these particular strategies of governance, in part, as you say, in a response to 9-11, but also as in a response to what I talk about in the book as a kind of naturalization of spirituality, which is kind of a long and complex argument to go into here. But um, there's a, more and more an understanding that people are naturally spiritual, and that it is the government's role. This is an argument that Winnie Sullivan develops in her book on chaplaincy that came out a couple years ago that is the government's role to create the conditions in which people's spirituality can flourish. And so it is a, kind of an, a, a sort of a, a, an understanding of what the government's job is, which is much more kind of overseeing and governing religion, this naturalization of spirituality. So there's a number of different factors, and I wouldn't want to reduce it only to 9-11, and I also wouldn't want to suggest that it started with 9-11. As you know, the International Religious Freedom Act was passed in 1998 and signed by President Clinton. So this, you know, this is predates 9-11. Um, there are also very interesting initiatives during the Cold War from a U.S. foreign policy perspective. Um, at the time, it was um, they had they went under different headings and more and more often called spiritual governments, spiritual freedom. And there were uh, government bureaucracies created. I talk about this in Chapter Four of the book. Uh, I think it's Chapter Four. Um, government bureaucracies created in Washington to work. In this case, it was less a question of um, Islam and it was more a question of Buddhism in Southeast Asia because of the wars that we were fighting there. And this had to do with the fight against communism, of course, in the sense that the U.S.'s role in that fight against communism was to ensure what was called at the time global spiritual health. And global spiritual health was something that should be cultivated by the government um, overseas and at home through a variety of initiatives, again, at home and abroad, um, that I talk about briefly here, and there's also been a, a number of really interesting books written on this. The most interesting, I think, is Jonathan Herzog's book, which is called The Spiritual Industrial Complex, and is about um, the Cold War politics, uh, specifically focusing on the 1950s and these, these questions. Um, so that gives you, I, I think that's a little window into what is a really big question. And so no, it's not new. And at the same time, I think that it's taking new forms. And I also think that given the world we live in and the kind of acceleration um, of time and space and the you know, crunching together of time and space, I guess you could say that there's a sense in which there's a possibility for a lot more of these programs to um, take off. And I think that we're seeing that um, to some extent. So thanks for your question. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's really important uh, not, you know, you know, I'm talking about a very specific set of questions here, and I'm bringing together, you know, religious studies and, and IR in a very particular way. And I don't want to uh, exaggerate and, you know, make people think that this is some big grand conspiracy. That there's a risk, I think, that coming across that I don't, I don't want it. I don't intend that. I don't mean that by what I'm doing. I'm really interested in trying to understand the, the world that's being created through religious freedom and through the, you know, the promotion of religious freedom and the understanding that there are these things called religious minorities out there that need protection. Um, because I think that's a, historically a contingent discourse and that we need to understand the kind of work it's doing and helping to 
create and manage these communities in, in, in particular ways. I don't want to exaggerate, though, and suggest that this is somehow timeless or that it's going to continue like this forever. As you brought up, and as we mentioned, um, I mentioned earlier today also, um, Canada it had uh, an office or has an office of international religious freedom that was copied from the U.S. office a few years back under Stephen Harper. And with the election of, uh, of Trudeau very recently, they are now um, reconsidering it. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about whether the office will be closed. Their budget's going to expire in March, I think, actually late this month. And there's a good chance that the office will not be renewed and it will not be reopened under Trudeau. And so there's a lot of debate going on. And it's certainly possible that um, you know things can shift and things can change and that this particular policy emphasis will be um, de-emphasized um, in, in a future, you know, by a future administration or a future uh, Congress or various bureaucratic arms. On the other hand, when you think about the way bureaucracies work, and those of you who study bureaucratic politics, you create the monster and it's really hard to get rid of, right? And that's what the Canadians are, are dealing with right now because you know, they have just a tiny version of what we have. We have a much bigger apparatus and we have many different offices and they have only one and it's got a tiny budget of $5 million, which is absolutely nothing, right, in governmental terms. So. Um, you know, it, I think that in the U.S. case, unlike Canada, we probably are in this for a longer haul, but nothing's forever, for sure. Can you remind me what the first point was? Because now I forgot. Sorry. Oh, between groups. Did you mean um, Did you mean whether public and private, like NGOs and the governments, are working together internationally or coordinating on this around this issue? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a huge. Um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a fairly large political movement that kind of, the, the public-private divide is not particularly relevant here, I think, for, it's not very helpful for thinking about this because the groups are working together and the governments are funding various NGOs to do this work and it's all very, like everything's very mixed up, right? But yeah, there's, I mean, there, if you look at what the European Union is doing, if you look at what the U.S. is doing, they're working, um, you know, on these issues together all of the time in coordinated efforts. There's also, I mean, apart from that, there's also, you could also think about uh, the role of um, a variety of uh, what has come to be known as the religious freedom bar in the U.S., which, um, you know, legal advocates, lawyers who are basically working this issue all of the time, and that bar itself has become transnationalized and internationalized, in part as a part of this, this broader kind of political and legal and discursive project that I'm writing about in the book. So there is a sense in which uh, religious freedom literally has gone global, and you see many of the same uh, advocates and activists and actors who are lobbying, uh, you know, who are submitting amicus briefs to the Supreme Court on these cases, on Hobby Lobby or whatever, they're also submitting amicus briefs to the European Court of Human Rights, and when they, you may, you may there's no reason you would know this, but the, in Kenya they had a big controversy, and I think it was 2010, some of you might know this, the constitutional controversy there around the, the whether the Sharia courts would become illegal or not, and the American Religious Freedom Bar, some of the groups who are most active here actually went there and set up an office and renamed it and became active lobbyists um, in that debate, which was mainly it ended up being a debate over abortion in that context, the right to, the right to choose. Very complicated scene, lots of interesting examples, but you're right to put your finger on this. This is, this is transnationalized, and a lot of, you'll see a lot of these groups popping up in different places, forging all kinds of um, you know, complex alliances and working together toward some of the common objectives that, that I was um, talking about a few minutes ago. So, thanks. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, of course.
Sure. That's kind of what I was pointing to, I think, in, uh, in trying to distinguish. And really what I'm trying to do is, rather than suggest that there is an authentic thing called lived religion that needs to be valorized and, and somehow, you know, in some mythic sense that it's going to be pure and it's going to be good, that's not at all what I'm talking about. And I tried to suggest that very briefly. I do spell that out in more detail in the book. Um, I'm really trying to help us simply gesture to help us see um, that whenever the uh, whenever there is a, a legal or a governmental kind of appropriation of religion, whenever there's expert religion or official religion, that that's not going to capture this much broader field, right? It's not. It's just not possible. And it's not to suggest that that field is, is good or it's bad. It may be both. It probably is both, right? Uh, it depends on your perspective and you know what your interests are and you know, how you see things. That's not really the point. The point is to help us to understand some of the limitations of the um, efforts that rely on a stable and singular understanding of religion as a category or an object of law and governance, right? And it's and what we lose or what we lose sight of when we fail to see that sort of broader lived spiritual realities, if you want to call them that, or ways of life. So um, yes, there is a, always a risk, and I hope that I'm I hope that I'm careful enough in sort of trying to be clear about what I expect these categories to do and not do, and also the sense that there's any sort of clear line between them is extremely problematic, and I suggested that, but only very briefly. Uh, these are obviously constituted, <laughs> you know, these are just heuristics. In reality, they're completely, they're messy, they're mixed up with each other, they're mixed up with institutional religion in ways that we can't really separate, right? I mean, it's very hard to say, um, you know, in any given context, you know, is this individual, is this institutional, how do we understand how people understand what they're doing, their practice, whatever it is. So, um, yes. I'm, I'm with you on that, and I want to be very cautious in how I'm using these terms as well. Um, your first question that you want to use to go to is about other categories. Um, so, you mean whether we can, whether it's similar, or whether we? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm not in the business of trying to create a perfect political community. I mean, this is one of the things that I think is really important to understand, is that I don't see my job as trying to somehow fix things that are broken. I'm trying to understand the world we live in and how particular, you know, and how these particular laws and regulations and political projects and discourses are shaping particular kinds of religious and political possibilities rather than suggesting that I want to, I mean, there's this, this urge to sort of find the solution or to remake or to make it better. I don't see that as my job. So, so no, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I wouldn't want to make a prescription that we need to get rid of the category and go for a different one. I don't think, no. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you very much. It was great to be here.